we briefly mentioned the position in the orthosis as having the possibility of increasing the work of flexion. Let's look at this. Historically, when flexor tendon repair began, the flexor tendon was held postoperatively in the same dressing for as much as six weeks. There was a significant fear of any motion pulling the tendon apart. As early motion protocols began, it was advocated that the wrist be held in flexion and the MP joints be held in flexion, often even more so than this illustration. And the view was that if the wrist and MP joints are flexed, that will take tension off of the flexors and thereby protect them. Now that we know that flexor tendon repairs can allow early motion, it is no longer appropriate for an active flexion protocol to position the wrist in a significant amount of flexion. Because we know from Savage and Kurza and colleagues that a position of wrist flexion increases the force required to flex the fingers because this position would place tension on the extrinsic extensors that tension creates increased resistance to flexion. Additionally, without the wrist stabilized in neutral or some extension, it's very difficult for the patient to transmit power of the flexors to the fingers for interphalangeal joint flexion. So the position of the wrist has become more critical as we move into active motion protocols. Only more proximal injuries where there needs to be protection to the nerve now have a clear indication of significant flexion at the wrist initially postoperatively. It's synergistic wrist extension. It's that stabilization of the wrist that really allows us to transmit our power into our finger flexors. Interestingly, slight wrist extension decreases the force required to flex the fingers. That's why you now see the synergistic protocol, and that's also why we often will, in the clinic, remove the orthosis and position the patient in a protective manner, but still allow wrist extension when the fingers are flexing. The position in the orthosis should be different for different zones. In zone two, for example, the wrist should be relatively extended because the range of motion at the wrist does not have to do with the excursion within zone two. Additionally, MP joint flexion should be limited because range of motion of the MP joint does not affect excursion within zone two. In zone five, at the level of the wrist, some wrist flexion is necessary because movement of the wrist will create the most tension on the repair at that location. But to prevent maximum tension, we make sure that if any extension of the wrist occurs, it occurs simultaneous to finger flexion, thereby removing a portion of the tension within the fingers when the portion at the wrist is increased. So this position is really no longer a practical and logical approach to postoperative tendon care. The additional factor we've not discussed is that MP joint flexion places the finger in a very intrinsic plus posture. This posture makes it extremely difficult to initiate finger flexion with the extrinsic flexors beginning with IP joint motion, which is the one specific goal following the surgery. Savage in 88 looked at keeping the wrist in the same position, but by increasing the joint flexion at the MP joint, to 90 degrees as compared to 45, he significantly increased the passive tension on the extensors. Increased tension on the extensors will 
demand increased pull of the flexors. In this graph, we're looking at the amount of force needed by the flexor digitorum profundus to actively flex the finger in four different positions of metacarpal phalangeal joint flexion, 0, 15, 45, and 60 degrees. Each of the four different colors represents a different position of the wrist as well as direction of finger motion. So if you just look at the blue, you're looking at flexion, and if you look at the orange, you're looking at extension. So let's make this a bit simpler to digest. Here we're only looking at finger flexion. With the wrist in zero is the light blue, and the darker blue is with the wrist in 30 degrees of flexion. We can see that with the MP at neutral or 15 degrees, there is significantly less resistance to the flexor digitorum profundus than if the MP is at 45 or 60. The wrist flexion does influence more negatively the more the MP joint is flexed. Also note that 15 degrees of metacarpal phalangeal joint flexion, whether the wrist is at zero or 30 degrees, provides the least resistance to the flexor digitorum profundus, suggesting that the ideal postoperative position would be 15 degrees of MP joint flexion. Here we're looking at the flexor digitorum superficialis instead of the profundus. And you'll notice that with the MP at 45 or 60 degrees and the wrist flexed to 30, that the resistance is significantly increased. So let's take the example that you have a patient who has a zone 2 laceration of both the FDS and FDP. Your protocol is to place the wrist in 30 degrees of flexion. But then if you also flex the MP joint to 45 or 60, you've greatly increased the resistance that will be encountered by the FDS. Compare that to the 15 degrees here in this chart, and you'll notice that that is as low or lower than in the previous FDP chart. Therefore, again, it appears ideal that the MP joints be at 15 degrees of flexion. Curzon and colleagues in 2006 looked at the actual tension needed during flexion and extension when they were operating on um, carpal tunnel patients. With the wrist at zero degrees or 30 degrees of flexion, they determined that there was limited risk to the repair in terms of rupture. They also noted that the FDS risk for rupture is increased as one increases wrist flexion. Kurza and colleagues concluded that active finger flexion and extension with the wrist either at zero or at 30 can be used early during rehabilitation with a limited risk of rupturing the repair. Now remember this is one variable and there are many others but this, as a general statement, can be accepted. Something else that we often don't discuss is that this posture in an immobilization orthosis will create an abnormal pattern of motion. Finger flexion will begin with the intrinsic muscles instead of beginning normally with the extrinsic muscles. That is in addition to the increased resistance, making it even more difficult to in initiate the extrinsic flexion. The extreme position of flexion of the wrist and the MP joints, then, would be less advantageous than less flexion. In looking at the tendon surgery of the handbook, I noted the protocols uh, that are reviewed from a variety of locations throughout the world. You will notice that the most wrist flexion in any protocol is 30 degrees. 
The MP joints were a bit less clear, Singapore being at 45, but they also place the wrist at zero. This supports the concept that protocols are moving toward less wrist flexion than previous. So the position used in the postoperative orthosis is determined by the level of the injury. Distal to zone 4, however, the wrist can safely be placed at 0 or 30 degrees of flexion and the MPs at 15 degrees of flexion if all other factors are equal. If there is an FDS injury, be cautioned that there should be less wrist flexion, and in all circumstances avoid extreme MP joint flexion because that does not facilitate the normal extrinsic pattern of flexion.